Right. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, today is a Lunch and Learn webinar. We've been doing uh, webinars for the last month or so since uh, we all have been at home. We thought this was a good way to connect with everyone. And uh, someone made the suggestion to try it at a different time of day than uh, 630. And we are. And we are so thankful that you are with us today. Today, our webinar will focus on voting rights in the age of COVID-19. And it is being hosted by Jen Samano, our campaign coordinator. Jen works on voting rights, data privacy, and here's a plug for tomorrow at four. She's doing another one, so Jen's been very busy this week, and we thank her. Um, and a lot of our electoral work, like get out the vote, uh, some of you may have canvassed with Jen in the past. Um, Jen is a community organizer, civil rights advocate. She lives in Denver, and prior to working at the ACLU, she was a campaign organizer for Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. She developed accountability campaigns there, which worked in coalition with community partners to mobilize Coloradans in defense of the Affordable Care Act, which we still have, thanks in part to Jen. She also organized for the 2016 election cycle in the 6th Congressional District. Thank you again, Jen, since I do live in the 6th Congressional District. And she has previously worked as an intern with SEIU Local 105, where she helped fight for fair wages. She is dedicated to Colorado, Coloradans voting rights, women's access to health care, and independent journalism, and as of recently, data privacy. So she'll tell you more about that tomorrow, plug, plug. Um, and uh, if you have questions during the webinar, there is a Q&A box. Please type your questions in there. When Jen is done with her presentation, uh, we will go through those questions. And if it's something that we can't answer, you can contact Jen through her email and she will have that up later. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jen. Hello everyone, thanks Delina. Um, hello to the faces I cannot see, but I know from the RSVP list that there's um, a lot of familiar folks and new folks, which is the best combination. So welcome back and welcome anew to everybody. Um, because this is a condensed version from our training, but we kept all the meaty good stuff so you can take action. Um, and um, we're gonna dive right in. And you're our first lunch and learn. So feedback is welcome and we're super happy to have you. Um, so talking about the way that the pandemic is affecting um, our access to the ballot. Let's go over some goals really quickly. So the goals in terms of the content of the presentation is simply to, so folks can walk away with more clarity and understanding about how exactly this pandemic is affecting our access to the ballot. Um, there's so much information, it's changing on a daily basis, it's changes by state, so hopefully so with some clarity and a clear head, we can see where we can act better um, and also feel less overwhelmed by it. Because I don't know about you, but these are overwhelming times. Um, and part of that is to review Colorado's election system. So what are your rights in Colorado specifically? Because that is obviously very relevant as ACLU of Colorado and as Colorado voting rights uh, advocates. Our advocacy goals, because the True goal of this presentation isn't just to broadcast information and for you all to keep that information nice, neat, and filed away into your brain. We want to make it actionable even during these times. Um, so the overall goal of this work is, of course, to implement um, administrative policies that will allow um, the preservation of our access to the fund or our to that preserve our access to the fundal, fundamental bedrock right, that is the right to vote, while also preserving our right to cast ballots safely um, and healthily, if that is a word. Um, and then the second goal to that is, of course, to mobilize ACLU supporters, <clears throat> you, the audience, and to advocate in your community. And that might sound scarier than it is, but what that can look like is, getting your brother to turn in their ballot or your neighbor or your friend. Um, that really, really does make a difference. And so we will quickly go through, in terms of agenda, we'll quickly go through the foundation. So what do you need to know? Um, what do we need to refresh or review to really understand what's going on with COVID now? Um, then we'll, of course, go through some COVID concerns with examples. And you may have guessed it, but ACLU has some recommended remedies, both at the federal and state level. So we'll We'll review those and then zoom on into Colorado. What is our, what are our voting rights look here? What does the system look like here? 
Um, and then of course, ending with advocacy actions, which I've jammed them all into a slide because there's a lot um, of ways for people to get involved and a reminder that it is 2020, a huge presidential election year. Um, of course, we're not just voting for president, we're voting for initiatives, local leaders, Congress, everything. Um, so this is the beginning of a conversation. Voting rights is a huge, huge topic. And so we're just looking at a chunk, but this is the beginning of a conversation and the beginning of our work. Okay, so two foundations. Another disclaimer here is that it's very hard as someone who likes to pack in too much information and loves history. I've cut out almost all of the history. This is a very condensed version, so I'm just putting it out there. Okay, so to guide this work, we have ACLU's voting rights principles. Um, all citizens should be able to vote. Voting should be free and easy. All votes should be counted equally. Okay, we're done, presentation closed, easy, clear, concise, agreeable. Of course, we know that's not the case. Since the day this country was founded until up to this very second, there has been the fight to access the ballot. Um, there's, for every group that is that was once disenfranchised and becomes re-enfranchised, um, a wave of suppression tactics follows. And while that history is infuriating and saddening, it also shows us something implicitly, which is that voting is very powerful. Uh, we wouldn't have adversaries or dominant groups trying to suppress, suppress people's votes and putting in so much time, money, and resource if voting wasn't so powerful. So that's something I like to keep in mind. The second thing is that voting advocates, even though there's been lots of sacrifice, have always won and will always continue to fight. Um, and so, to review those two things I just touched on, disenfranchisement and suppression, um, we, we distinguish them here just for the sake of learning, but you'll see them used interchangeably, although they're, they're technically different definitions. So disenfranchisement is the explicit revocation of the right to vote. Um, so that can look like you can't vote because you have a criminal record. Voter suppression is the intentional blockage to make it difficult for you to exercise that right. And like I had just previously said, every time a group becomes re-enfranchised, a new wave of suppression tactics follows to continue to block access. And so what I like to think of is disenfranchisement is closing the door, while suppression is the door is open, but there's a ton of obstacles um, that make it difficult to get through that door. In 2020, um, some major concerns of, or types of suppression concerns are misinformation concerns, uh, disinformation and intimidation. So misinformation and disinformation are separate. Uh, misinformation is unintentional spread of incorrect or erroneous information. Disinformation is intentional spread of that information. Um, and intimidation is what it sounds like, trying to scare people away from exercising their right to vote. And so disinformation and intimidation can come together in the same packet or, or package or separate, but often together. Um, and we'll kind of dive more into why those are relevant later in the presentation. Um, this is again just because I can't keep all of history out of this presentation. It's again, again, touching on the point, and this is an advocacy presentation, that the right to vote has been fought for very hard our entire lives, and that fight continues today. Often that fight is led by people who are directly impacted. That's Black Americans, especially in the 60s, um, students, and, uh, and also allies who are sitting in solidarity. So that's why I've included this picture, just kind of ground us in that, and that we are continuing that legacy. Okay, so it's also, especially understanding the COVID uh, stuff with voting is, uh, making the distinguishment in, or like realizing where federal jurisdiction and state ju versus state jurisdiction when it comes to the administration of elections and then state versus county. Um, and to zoom all the way back up, when we talk about elections administrations, what we're talking about is the mechanics of voting. So how we know that everyone has a right to cast a ballot, but where's your ballot coming from? When are you receiving it? How are you returning it? How is it being counted? How is the state communicating about it? those sorts of things. So again, all the mechanics to make voting hap happen. So the federal government has jurisdiction in that they are, they can and do say, for example, all states have to have absentee voting, which we'll get into in the next slide. Great, so they can set the standard, but it's up to the states as to exact implementation. So they can put out that, that um, requirement, but the states implementing it, it will look different depending on what state you're in, because that's the state's right in terms of implementation. 
um, which again, we'll make, we'll flesh that out further in the next slide. So there's a similar dynamic, although a little less fraught between state and county. So in the, on the state level, um, you know, we have legislators who can make laws affecting voting and we, um, and then it's primarily the Secretary of State that administers elections, that can make rules. And the Secretary of State, work, State works with the counties. The counties carry out the actual elections, do the, do the mechanics, those are where you go to vote, the people you probably see if you vote in person. Okay, so this is super important to understand when we're talking about COVID concerns, which is the next slide. So what's the difference between absentee and vote by mail? You'll, you know, I, I have been yelling at the radio recently because uh, there are reporters who are using them as the same, but they're really not. Um, don't worry, I support journalism. Uh, but for us as advocates, it's important to understand the difference. So voting by absentee ballot, like I had just said, is all states have to provide a way for people to vote by absentee ballot. But the, but the process for acquiring um, an absentee ballot will look different depending on the state. The qualifications in order to be allowed to cast an absentee ballot will look different by state. So what you're saying with the absentee ballot is like, I was unable to vote in person for X, Y, Z reason, um, traditionally. But now there are a lot of states that um, just send out absentee ballots automatically to registered voters. However, there's still a third of states that require an excuse. So rather than just automatically getting an absentee ballot in the mail, they have to, the onus is on the individual to go and apply requests from the state that they receive this ballot. Um, and also that requires um, them to qualify. Um, then you have vote by mail state, uh, vote by mail states and some counties. Vote by mail, this is what we have in Colorado, means that every registered voter receives a ballot. It's not an absentee ballot, it's just a ballot. Um, you don't have to request it, you will automatically receive it for every election. Um, and so the states that have this are Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. Um, in Oregon, it is all, ma it's mail only, there's no option to vote in person in Washington and Colorado, you still retain um, the ability, or you still have the option to go vote in person. So you can choose, I'm gonna return it by mail, Dropbox, or vote in person. Um, and, and in California, it's not a statewide um, policy to do vote by mail ballots, but it is, there are a lot of counties who have implemented it. So that kind of goes back to the state versus county jurisdiction. Okay, so what we're all here for is COVID concerns, and hopefully that's background. Um, you'll see why it's relevant to really fleshing this out. And again, most of the concerns have to do with admin the administration of elections and people's ability to access their ballots in a way that is, um, preserves their own safety and health, as well as the safety and health of um, people working. Okay, so the first one, transmission concerns passing along the virus by voting in person. Um, our case study, and I'm gonna be brief on these case studies just because this is a lunch bite. Um, in Milwaukee, in the beginning of April, there was in-person voting that occurred without any precautions um, or changes into the, in, the, in the way this in-person voting was conducted. There was a lot of advocates fighting for a postponement of the election, but um, ultimately lost. And so we know that because there were no um, precautions or protections put in place, that it, there, I mean, this was two weeks ago, there was at least seven uh, COVID cases that came um, from a polling place in Milwaukee. Um, another uh, concern that we're seeing is disparities creating disenfranchisement. This case study in Virginia um, is a good example of this. So in Virginia, if you vote absentee, um, you have to have a witness sign your ballot. Obviously, that requirement goes against um, the public health recommendations um, of the state and and so how, how do you reconcile that if you live alone? Um, do you risk your health so you can cast your right to, or so you can exercise your right to vote? Um, so that's the case that we're, that's what we're seeing in Virginia. That's why the ACLU has um, uh, filed a lawsuit um, to fight this. And this case in Virginia most negatively impacts um, older voters of color. 
So that's a that's creating a form of that's a disparity creating a form of disenfranchisement because people who are preserving their health really don't have a choice. Um, then we have the issue of postage, which we're seeing in several states. Um, and ACLU says that that's a version of a poll tax because folks don't have another option to go uh, voting to vote safely, so they have to vote by mail. But the or vote by absentee ballot, but the absentee ballot requires postage. That's money. That's a poll tax. And so in Georgia, you not only have to include postage on your, you have to include postage on your application, and then your actual ballot. So we are suing in Georgia and a handful of other states. There's also the problem of misinformation. Um, this goes back to the beginning of you know distinguishing misinformation from disinformation. I'm not saying there won't be disinformation all over the place about any, you know, um, adjustments states make for voting. But right now we're already seeing the issue of misinformation. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of education before this in many states on, on the absentee ballot process. So there's a lot of confusion on top of the confusion of um, folks might hear of what the state is considering, but it's not actually enacted yet. And people acting on that, yada, 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 bureaucracy misinformation problems. Okay, we have suggestions that will resolve all of these problems. So let's go through them really quickly. Um, so on the federal level, again, going back to distinguishing what can the federal government do to compel states um, to take actions? And here it is. One thing that would make a huge different is, difference is the federal government has, through Congress, um, has the ability to, to say that all states have to provide no excuse absentee voting. And so that would mean that one third of states that doesn't have it right now would have to then offer it. Um, again, it's up to the states how they want to implement that, but they would, it would, they would have to provide no excuse absentee voting. Same thing for the second point, requiring 14 days of early voting, um, including one Saturday and one Sunday. And again, federal government has the power to compel states to do that. Um, and of, the next two are to do with money. Um, we are still fighting for $3 billion um, in funding for states to implement changes in response to COVID. Um, because if you think about it, well, we're asking states to overhaul their election systems in a, in a span of really several weeks between. And we have two elections, we have the primary and the general. We're asking them to um, often hire new personnel, buy equipment, buy new software, buy new machines. It is a ton of money. Um, the fourth one is $4 million to the US Election Assistance Commission. Um, the Election Assistance Commission is, is really a coordinating body that was established in 2002 off of the Help America Votes Act. And it's, and its entire purpose is to serve, again, to coordinate between the federal government and states, because we can imagine that all of this funding and changes, we need a coordinating body. And we also are suggesting with uh, within that $4 million, some is set aside for public education that um, the Assistance Commission will help with, help coordinate. Um, because again, all of, all of this will take um, a lot, a lot of public education and that's where us advocates can help. So some state recommendations. So what can the state do to increase access to the ballot during COVID? Um, one thing off the bat is extending deadlines. So Extending the deadline to apply for an absentee uh, ballot is a really good example. Expanding methods um, for applying and returning, for example, putting a, um, a drop-off location outside of a polling place or a school or something like that. Um, prepaid postage on all applications. And then early processing of absentee ballots. There are four states who don't start processing them until after election day and about a dozen who start processing on election day. The reason this is important is because we can anticipate that a lot, a lot of people will be participating in the election via absentee ballot and we don't want to bottleneck um, the counting of those ballots because you voters should have faith in the system that um, they're casting their ballot and they wouldn't feel as faithful if it takes weeks and weeks for their ballot to be counted because of an arbitrary law saying we can't um, count absentee ballots until election. Um, this one's also important. Provide notice of, of discrepancy and opportunity to cure. So what does that mean? A good example or a case study of this is in Georgia, um, where 
absentee ballots were being rejected because of signature discrepancies. So that means that your voter registration form, the signature looks different than um, the signature you signed your ballot with, which is a common um, security measure, but it becomes an issue when there's no way for the voter to uh, resolve that discrepancy and say, no, count me, that was my ballot. Um, and this can result, you know, without having this uh, process, we leave open a, too much power for poll workers and also a lot of room for bias via racism to come out. Because again, what we saw in the last election cycle is that most of the ballots that were getting rejected were um, for non-dominant groups, like non-white groups, names that didn't look like Tim Smith. Um, and so having that opportunity to cure, make sure that your ballot, the voter has a, a, a chance to advocate for themselves. Okay, more stuff for the state. Um, we are advocating that states elimin eliminate any special requirements for first time voters. So in some states, if you're a first time voter, you have to vote in person. Obviously, we're saying get that out of here. We're in a pandemic. Um, we're also, and this is important, we are also really advocating that uh, states maintain the option for in-person voting, which can sound counterintuitive, um, especially if we looked at Milwaukee. The reason for this is, is that there are lots of groups who have the right to voting accommodations, and most of those accommodations, they access or take place in in-person voting. What does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, for example, there are people with physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, um, people who English is their second language or they have um, low literacy ratings or scores. All groups like that, first time voters especially too, all um, really utilize in-person voting because they can receive the accommodations that they have a right to. And so as voting rights advocates, we are we are saying, hey, keep those in-person voting locations open. But we're also saying protect the poll workers, protect the people who are coming into those in-person voting locations, um, provide protective equipment, put in standards, et cetera, et cetera. The very obvious um, stuff that they did not do in Wisconsin. And part of that poll worker stuff is recruiting new poll workers. Most poll workers now um, are above 60 and fall into the group of more of that vulnerable group. Um, so we're gonna need people who are not in those vulnerable poll groups, generally younger folks to um, help work polls so we can still administer elections safely. Um, and then expanding, expanding the voter health hotline. This is important. This goes back to those groups with accommodations who have a right to accommodations. By we can we need to maintain in-person voting, yes, but we can also um, rightfully assume that there will be less people using in-person voting, and some of those folks still might need accommodations. So by beefing up the voter help hotlines, we can still um, provide accommodations and voter assistance. And then all of this is pretty much irrelevant without aggressive public education. People have been voting the same way. Um, there's a lot of input, there's a lot of stress, there's a ton of disinformation, so it's going to take aggressive public education and the state should take a, large, take a role funding um, and using their platform and helping to do that. And of course, you know, Will, you and I will do it too. Okay, in Colorado. Um, Colorado, we have early voting, we have same day voter registration, we have mail ballots that again, everyone gets a mail ballot and we have voter, voter service and polling centers. Voter service and polling centers um, are like your polling places, but better. You can go to anyone in your county to receive voter services um, and they're open for two weeks. Um, they're, they're not just, uh, you know, go cast your ballot in a precinct. So again, early voting, we have three weeks to do that. Same day voter registration, single policy that increases voter participation the most. We have mail ballots that can be returned either through USPS mail system or as pictured here in a drop box, which are open 24 hours and you can return at any drop box in Colorado, even outside of your voting county. Um, this all came from a 2013 bill and has led to an increase in voter turnout, a decrease in costs because there's less provisional ballots, um, 
in a national leadership position. We lead the country in voter access. And it's really important that folks know this. It might sound strange that an ACLU person is like, look how great the government is. But a lot of these changes have come from voter advocates, right? And um, it's really, really important that we clarify for the folks around us in our own communities, our little hubs, what our right to vote is here. Because I hear a lot of times people, you know, confusing with a different state or thinking we don't have same day voter registration or that they can't use a drop box. And so it's very important if our goal is to, to increase access and participation is to help clarify locally. What's going on locally? Because that really inspires people to, to participate when they have the clear information. Um, this, I can send out, just want to put the requirements up here. We are a voter ID state, however, voter ID includes utility, bills, bank statements, whatever, and if you don't have that, not whatever, read the, read the list and I'll send it around, but if you don't have those things, you can sign an affidavit when you're voting in person. So we do have ID requirements, um, but they're considered uh, more open. And so I've kind of already alluded to it, but what we are doing in Colorado, because we meet all those recommendations, um, is really, really doing the on the ground work of um, demystifying disinformation, um, providing people with clear, accurate information so they can exercise their right to vote. And with that, um, um, we would, here are all the ways that you can get involved, which I will send around because it looks like we're wrapping up again, first time um, doing the lunch and learn. But basically we are looking for a volunteer. What you should be doing is telling, you should be updating your voter registration, that's a huge one, to make sure that your ballot is going to your home that you live in now. Yeah, a lot of people move or your, your circumstance could have changed. Or maybe you're taking care of someone and you're, on the Western Slope and you usually live in Denver, you can change your mailing address so that you receive it on the Western Slope, but you're still voting in your home district, right? Like you can have a mailing vote, um, address that is different than your home voting address. You can still access that ballot. And we challenge you to tell three of your friends um, to do the same thing, which seems small and arbitrary. However, A, setting, setting yourself goals means you're more likely to do it, um, and B, it might seem really small right now, but it, so does quarantining and social isolating. And we know scientifically that even though it feels small as an individual, there's a huge collective impact. And honestly, I would take that mindset into voting and really talking to your networks. Um, I'll email everyone else the rest of these, but we're also looking for people to join our voting rights volunteer team. Because like I said, we have a lot of work to do um, in 2020. That's all. <laughs> Great, Jen. Thank you uh, so much for that lunch bite, as uh, Jen's going to rename Lunch and Learns, too. Um, we do have a couple of questions. And if you have questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A box. So Jen, with COVID risk likely still in play, is anything being done to ensure those experience homelessness and therefore unable to get a mail-in ballot the usual way? who are also in the vulnerable group so that they can safely vote. So is it just basically the question is, what, what kind of outreach and advocacy work on this issue with the homeless community? For sure. So. Um, so again, that goes back to the good thing that we can change um, mailing address. Uh, and for the, the right to vote for folks experiencing homelessness in Colorado looks like this, is that when you're registering to vote as a person experiencing homelessness, you put as wherever you identify as home. So it could be Colfax and Grant, because that's where you spend time at Civic Center. Um, however, then you put separately, you obviously can't mail something to Colfax and Grant, so you do have to put a valid mailing address. It could also be a church, um, a shelter, an outreach group. So it takes some coordination um, but there are a lot of the churches, the group, um, and shelter groups already have those programs in place. And then we have our awesome partner groups like the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and the Badass Denver Homeless Out Loud group, which obviously is um, in Denver, who do a lot of um, So I'm guessing that if like, uh, I forgot what complex, you know, they've taken a couple of Denver city complexes 
during COVID, you know, they could change their address to that location, if that makes sense. And there will need to be a lot of outreach and a lot of outreach to tell folks experiencing homelessness that, hey, we're still providing in-person voting because there might be an assumption that it's just not an option this year. Very good. Um, next question, uh, though, postage page paid is the best because it allows for impoverished voters to vote without concern. Would even a special reduced postage for mail-in balloting be a compromise that the state and federal government might find amenable? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's um, a couple ways to look at that. One, so in Colorado, we don't pay for postage. And part of the reason for that is because we provide, we as a state provide drop boxes. You need to think about it, the absentee states um, don't have those because they're not mail voting places. They might have them, but that's all to be announced and our federal government isn't taking that leadership. Uh, and so for other states, I think that would be amicable, but I'm going to let everyone in on a little secret. Postal <laughs> service in their own written policies has that they will net, they will always deliver a ballot. They will never not. It is their own policies. So what happens is that the state eats the cost of that post, usually the county that you're voting in. And so if you want to, if you want to go very rogue, if states aren't do it, providing any accommodations, quite honestly, I would tell people, hey, turn in your ballot, it will be delivered. That's the ACLU way, I think. And it's not really talked about often, right? <laughs> because it is a cost and it will be, if, if everybody did that, it would be very expensive for counties, but we have a right to exercise our, the right to vote and I think you should cast your ballot, so tell your friends. I think we're really lucky here, though, with the uh, mail, uh, the drop-off boxes. Yeah, I and mean, mm -hmm. they're most everywhere. Folks, yeah, and most folks prefer the drop box because, well, like you said, they're everywhere. And again, um, I was talking very fast, but in in Colorado, you can leave a ballot, you can return your ballot at any drop box in the state. It doesn't need to be county specific, which is really awesome. Mm -hmm. And most people prefer the drop box because they feel wary sending it in, in USPS and there have been issues with getting ballots back and issues with yeah. USPS. Yeah, so this is actually really direct. Dropbox is over 90% of Coloradans use the Dropbox. Yeah. And, you know, we have drive up drop boxes out here. Yeah. I don't know if everybody else does, but I find those to be really. Even amazing. in Denver, we have. Oh, even in Denver? I bet they invented it. Um, <laughs> and Wendy, one of our great volunteers, is asking how we can help advocate for other states to move in these directions. And um, uh, and wasn't it true that Republicans in Colorado also supported our um, the I think she's referring to the uh, uh, modern modernization um, stuff that went through in I think it was 2013. Um, mm -hmm. So shouldn't they reach out to other Republicans in other states and tell them how great it's worked here? I think yes. I think if you have any friends with you know that I have conservative friends, I would use them to ad help advocate, or at least when you're advocating in other states, you know, that's a great highlight. Uh, another highlight, and partially probably why um, the more conservative folks uh, supported the 2013 bill is that there's a decrease in cost. It went from about $14 per ballot to eight, $8 per ballot, which is really significant. Um, another way to advocate in other states is to really um, push for like if there's a lot of options right but if you're trying to increase um, access during COVID it's pushing for no excuse absentee voting um, and if you're trying to push for increased participation even before COVID it was it's the policy of same-day voter registration uh, uh, that makes the biggest difference in participation but it's it's other than that I really don't mind for folks to reach out to me uh, directly if they have friends or family or their home state is really bad and I could connect you with the ACLU in that state and help you get involved there. There's also, finally, there's also the option to really pay attention to the federal funding fight. Um, I know that there's another package that they're um, of stimulus relief that they're working on and in that we're still fighting again for them to include that suggested three billion dollars for elections um and there will be a petition we can send out so that's one good way is sharing that petition um 
So it's like a smorgasbord, but you can contact me if you're looking for something direct for a specific state. Um, have people advocate for no excuse absentee voting and same day voter registration. Um, and pay attention to the, the next federal stimulus plan. Yes, definitely. And there is some sort of a action you said that ACLU yes, is doing in this. Okay. There's, a, uh, there's an online petition to sign and I highly recommend sharing that as well. Okay, great. We have one more question. Um, and this is from Sin, another great volunteer. And, um, and there's a lot of uh, truth behind this. A uh, recent Stanford sh study shows that mail-in voting does not favor either party. So um, use that Stanford study because there is kind of an idea out there that one party is um, more, uh, you know, helped by mail-in voting and what that hasn't, that's not true. <laughs> that's just one of those urban legends, I guess. Disinformation. Actually, that is thank you because I didn't touch on it in this presentation as an example of disinformation is saying that uh, mail-in voting increases voter fraud. That's disinformation because its intention is nefarious, which is to uh, decrease participation and access. Um, and the narrative is, is intentionally and entirely false. So, and Sin, if you would send me that study, because I don't even know it. Uh, I would there we go. We have such great volunteers and wonderful supporters. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Oh, we got one more. Um, and that's Sin saying she will send you the link. Thank you. And um, so if you have any more questions, now's the time. Otherwise, I'm going to tell you all about tomorrow night, tomorrow afternoon's webinar. It's going to be Jen again because I'm overworking her this week. <laughs> it's on data privacy. and. Um, I can't wait for it because I know that um, that has been affected like everything else by COVID. So I am excited to learn more and I hope you will join us tomorrow. It is at four. It is up on the peoplepower.org website where you can sign it out. A, an email went out earlier today. Um, hopefully you got that. There's a link to sign up in there. And if all else fails, you can um, just ask Jen or I and we'll get you the link. All right, Jen, thank you so much once again for all this great information. And we hope that all of you will join us tomorrow at four. Thank you.